The Duchess of Argyll, famed for her charisma, beauty and style. But who was the real Margaret Campbell? And what does a very British scandal tell you about the culture of double standards endured by women in the 1960s? Before we begin, beware, this video may contain spoilers. The future Duchess was born in 1912 as Ethel Margaret Wiggum, the daughter of self-made Scottish millionaire George Wiggum and his wife Helen. By her late teens, Margaret was a regular figure within British society and in 1930 was launched as a debutante in London with an extravagant coming out ball. She was named Debutante of the Year and from then on would be associated with beauty, glamour and elegance. It was a party every night, if not two or three. It was heaven. Absolute heaven. Margaret lived at an extraordinary time in history, her privilege affording her much wealth, social prestige and attention. She was often featured in the pages of society magazines and regularly pictured with the men in her life. This would have been considered brazen in a society that expected women to be discreet, but Margaret made no apologies for who she was. We had wonderful music, wonderful people to dance with, very pretty dresses, very pretty girls, beautiful men. What more do you want? Just like in our drama, the real Margaret also delighted in dogs and had a particular fondness for miniature French poodles. On the 21st of February 1933, Margaret married Charles Sweeney at the Brompton Oratory in London. It was the wedding of the season and traffic was blocked for three hours with crowds, all hoping to catch a glimpse of the bride's dress. I know what's going to become me, and that's all that matters. I think, I think you should actually wear the dress and not the dress wear you. But the Sweeneys were divorced in 1947, and four years later, Margaret would become the third wife of the 11th Duke of Argyll. It was long rumoured that the Duke married Margaret for her family's money, using it to restore his crumbling legacy in Verera Castle. But Margaret was no fool and was well aware of the Duke's money problems. I tell you what did save my father's money. I think the gift on that occasion was of the order of quarter of a million pound. And it was needed and used, and Ian was very pleased, very pleased but, but the way he behaved afterwards was unforgivable. Was he a man who needed money? Ian, oh, stony broke which we all knew, and we didn't blame him for it. It's bad luck, and we tried to help. Did he marry you for love or for money? I, I don't know. I simply don't know. I knew I loved him. I knew I wanted to save in Verena desperately badly. What he felt, I don't know. However, their relationship was turbulent, and in 1959, the Duke sued the Duchess for divorce on grounds of adultery, and so began the court case that would dominate the front pages of British newspapers in the 1960s, featuring accusations of forgery, drug-taking, bribery, and, of course, that Polaroid picture. A pair of Polaroid photographs were shown in court showing the Duchess, naked, wearing only her signature three-string of pearls, and engaged in a sexual act with a man whose face could not be seen. He would go on to be known as the Headless Man. Throughout the long and sensational court case, Margaret was criticised from every angle in the press and her private life strewn across the pages a prejudice that was not afforded to the Duke in equal measures. Goodness, no, I've had the most ghastly publicity in the world. But in the early days, you know, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and even the 60s, I think, you know, publicity, the ordinary little diary column, was very pleasant. You know, you looked, you looked well, pretty in pink at a party or something. There was no harm in it. And we all enjoyed our little paragraph. There was absolutely no malice, and we all were great friends of the, um, of the writers. But I must say, I think lately, I think the diarists, which I mean by press, I don't mean the press, you know, the front page, the diarists have become, I think, very unkind, you know, to put it quite mildly. A pioneer of the sexual liberation that was to come later in the 1960s, Margaret was openly vilified for the power that she held over men. Lord Wheatley, the judge, described the Duchess as a completely promiscuous woman 
and the 50,000-word judgment was one of the longest in the history of the Edinburgh court, leaving Margaret's reputation in high society beyond recovery. But despite all the adversities she endured, Margaret remained defiant. She never revealed the name of the headless man and continued to exude a powerful sense of self until the end. Well, you live in a hotel now, though, don't you? Is that... I do. I live at Grover House. I have a penthouse there and I love it. Is it, is it not a kind of restricted or constricting life for you there? It's not restricting. Restricting or... What else? Constricting. Constricting heaven. <laughs> it's heaven. All the staff are wonderful. They all look after you. You have security. And I have a lovely, lovely penthouse. And I wouldn't change it for the world.